It's Nancy Maddox Shine. from Shine Your Light Radio Ministry on WYTV7 in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm broadcasting from Little Rock, Arkansas, and my guest today is from Lebanon, Missouri. So I'm so excited to get started. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that WYTV7 is a nonprofit, and we do use our donations to the nonprofit to uh, to advertise and to put and to really get our broadcast out there in the international community. So we are also on iHeartRadio. So uh, please uh, sow a seed into WYTV7. Yesterday was the day of giving and I would love if you would do that so we can make all of our broadcasters shine. So thanks a lot. Today we have a really special guest. I'm really excited to have her. She is a published author and also a survivor of domestic violence. And this was in the days when domestic violence was not really known. It was known to certain people in the family and maybe maybe your boss or something like that. But in the old days, uh, domestic violence was the same as it is now, only it, it, it never took the side of the, per, the victim. So uh, times have changed a lot. And Miss uh, Ms. K.D. Esther, from uh, Le Lebanon, Missouri, has written a book called Standing in the Shadows. She was a victim 45 years ago of domestic violence, and her book is absolutely fantastic. We're going to talk about her testimony today and talk about how she got where she is, what God did for her and, and her book, and how it can help all domestic violence victims. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, um, Miss uh, KD, can you tell can tell us a little bit about your your testimony and where you got where you are today from where you were? Well, um, I'm 65 today. You know, September was my birthday, and I wrote this book about 25 years ago. I just felt led to write about it because it's such a serious issue. And um, I got rejected 11 times sending it out to publishers. So I thought, well, there's a time and a season, as the word says, for everything. And I thought this just isn't the time. So I, I put it away. I've got boxes and boxes of journals. Because 45 years ago when I was going through this, um, I come from poor means and couldn't uh, afford psychiatrists or help. And, and even though I had brothers and sisters, we weren't raised to help one another. So I didn't turn to my family and um, I was alone. And so um, <clears throat> I started going to a library because the library was free and I would read books. And I knew that whenever I, um, uh, my mother kicked me out at 17 and this, this first, first in a lifetime at 17 boyfriend, showed no signs i had no red flags pop up to indicate to me this was a bad thing to get into and because my mother threw me out of the house she was done with kids um i went and we got married and it started after we got married and being that i came from abuse you learn very sad to admit you learn to take abuse it you learn to get comfortable with pain and that's a bad thing. And so that's where, you know, I, I was so angry at God and I said, you know, God, uh, I survived my childhood and now I have to live through this. I can't do it no more. I'm done. I can't do this no more. What do I do? And my best friend came and knocked on the door and she says, uh, why don't you join your a self-defense class with me? And I thought, hmm, paint the kettle black if it's black. You know, he's beating me every day. So maybe I need to just whoop him is where I was thinking, you know. I had at the time developed from learned behavior, as I want to say to the audience, if you're in an abusive relationship, you develop what I term stinking thinking. You believe that you are the fault. You believe that you're worthless. You believe that you're ugly. 
you believe that you have no self-esteem because it's instilled by the abuser. And I just didn't feel any power within me. I just felt like a whoop dog. But when I took this self-defense class that 45 years ago, it empowered me. It did something to me. And it just, I looked in the mirror and I said, you have value. God did not create you to live this way. You, you have a purpose and, and this is not the way to go. And so I warned him. It was a daily thing that I took a beating, unfortunately. And I warned him, if you hit me, be prepared because I will no longer allow you to abuse me. And that's in my book. I, I wrote this story in my book. I use this particular story because it's so, it's, it's, it's not what I would term drama, but it's very dramatic. And um, of course, it, he ke always came home drunk and he proceeded his normal ritual thing. And sure enough, it, it just kicked in what I was taught in self-defense. And I did, I, I, I whooped him. And I slept with, the, I called the police. We went through this whole little ritual thing and the police officer took me to the side because see back then a police officer could walk in your home, see that you're, there's an abuse, domestic violence situation, but she could be black and blue, but they would walk out. I would have had to go to the police, sign uh, an order against him, then go to court, blah, blah, blah. And I had tried that in these four and a half years and how he ever found me, I don't know, but he always drug me back. And so I, I quit doing that and I just took the beatings. So I slept with a baseball bat in my hand and the next day I walked out. I left my furniture and I had a beautiful home. I had beautiful furniture, a new truck. All I had was a shirt on my back, but I had a job. And I called my boss and that started my career. So this is where God's divine intervention came in. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. That is a very dramatic story. But, you know, what? when was that? Was that in, like, the 60s or 70s that that 70s, happened? In the 70s. Okay. Well, that, you know, I, I, I understand that because as I was growing up, uh, I was in a domestic violence household. Not me, but my mother. That was in the 50s and 60s. And she yeah. uh, really uh, did the same. It sounds exactly like the scenario of her, only she never defended herself. She just waited until her last child turned 18, which was my baby brother, and then she left and went home to her parents. But it sounds exactly like that. In those years, in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the police didn't do anything. They never took up for the victim ever, whether it was the man or the woman, they always just came in and tried to make the peace and then leave. But it, then it happened again and again. So you were very courageous. And I, I do admire you for taking a self-defense class. I'd never thought of that, but that's really, um, that teaches you obedience too. So, I mean, God led you in the right direction when you took that self-defense class, and then it gave you the self-confidence and the self-esteem to take care of yourself and to leave, which is really the major problem. And you said he kept coming and getting you and bringing you back and that kind of thing. And that happens all the time, even in this day and time. You can you can't get away from your you can't get away from your abuser. They have a total control over you. So I think your book is going to be really, really important. And this interview is going to be very important for people that are in a situation now. And it doesn't matter if yours happened 45 years ago. It's the same. It's the same mentality, the same thing over and over and over again. And I think this is going to really help a lot of people. I'm really excited to hear more, more about the book. So I have some more questions. As I was reading through your uh, bio, I read I read a few things, like you said, um, uh, stinking thinking. I was going to ask you about that. So thanks for bringing that up. And you said that uh, we need to escape their own demise. And that's really hard. For one thing, they don't really have enough confidence and self-esteem to understand that they, they are in a demise. And then also you said that uh, bondage of domestic violence. 
I don't believe I've ever quite heard it put that way, but it is bondage of a certain way. So can you elaborate a little bit on that, on, on how, how you come to the thinking of it being bondage of domestic violence? Because I haven't heard it put that way. Well, the, the word calls sin bondage. And bondage is the, um, our sin. If we say yes to sin, we are the ones that are tempted daily through our sinful nature. And then anyone out there that understands the principles and the concepts of salvation is first to be saved so your soul lives eternally and second, to be changed. And so that stinking thinking came from learned behavior because I was raised in an abusive household. But I was raised to take a beating. I wasn't raised to fight back. And so I took the beating from my ex-husband until I realized I can't take the beating no more. I was a tiny little thing back 45 years ago. And he was, I, I don't know. It's a God thing. Grace, by the grace of God go I is what I say all the time. And um, bondage is when you are stuck, when you feel like you can't get out and it's a weight, it just hangs on you. And it's like, it makes you feel helpless. It makes you feel hopeless. It makes you feel like it's your fault. And when they see that they've done this damage to you after the fact, the next day you've got a black eye like this, maybe your jaw is broke, maybe you're black and blue, and then they apologize and they cry and they say, I'm sorry, and then you take them back. It's just a repetitious cycle. And in my book, I just realized, you know, um, it's actually a 12-step program. Her chapter title is how I got out. Chapter one is recognize. You got to recognize you're in a, a domestic violence situation. Chapter two is reality. You know, we become very delusional when we are in a domestic violent relationship. We're not thinking for ourselves. We're always worrying about when the next punch is gonna come. It, it is, am I doing anything wrong that's gonna deserve a beating? We're so worried about it, you know? So you gotta well, come to Excuse me, most of the time, you it doesn't even take you doing anything wrong. I mean, anything right. can trigger that violence. I mean, it can be from the, the best thing that happened all day to you, I know in the case of my mother, she could put, she could slave over the stove for two or three hours and put a beautiful meal on the table. And then he didn't like the way she looked or he didn't like one word she said and the table would be turned over and all our food would be on the ground. And this is when I was a kid. So uh, it doesn't really take any triggers. You, ju you don't, you just don't know. I mean, it can be the best thing that happened today or the worst thing that happened today it could be a word you said it could be you rolling your eyes it could be anything that you do so i i like that chapter in the book so go ahead well but that is the bondage that is the actual visual perspective of what bondage what sin produces is that bondage it doesn't mm. take much and um you get comfortable with that and so um if you follow the 12 steps, I'm very detailed about the third chapter is the three, the three abuses, sexual, physical, and emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, emotional abuse is just as damaging as physical abuse. Absolutely. You know, because it destroys the mind. It creates that stinking thinking that I said. So um, the second step that I took, you know, praise the Lord, I had a good job. 45 years ago is where I started my career that I've retired from now, and that's taking care of private duty hospice elderly people who preferred to die in their home instead of in the hospital or nursing home. And I made good wages, and I called my boss and I said, I want seven days a week, six hours, six, um, seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And then I went to my friend that helped me with the self-defense. She was married and had two babies. And I said, all I want is your couch. I'll sleep on the couch. I won't touch none of your food. I ate one can of Chef Boyardee spaghetti because it was 25 cents a can. And I went to work and I saved enough money to pay for my divorce, buy a car, get an appointment and get a wardrobe. And I was on my way. And then I started going to the library and studying to create a new, I hadn't gotten into the word of God yet. I just knew that there was a God 
he was there, but I didn't know how to connect my spirit to his because I didn't understand faith. And well, speaking of that, I read too in your Bible, uh, since you brought that up, that you said I connected to God and that you said human nature equals a sinful nature. So can you talk a little bit about that, about how you developed that concept of human nature being sinful nature? Well, we're human beings born with a mind, a soul, and a spirit. And the sinful nature is the curse God put on man through Adam and Eve. Well, that's in our soul. Our sinful nature lives in our soul. It's what I think, what I want, what I feel. So our sinful nature is in every one of us. And if we don't develop the nine fruits of the spirit, which is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, we are not going to be able to get out of that bondage. We are not going to be able to recognize that our, we are in sin and maybe what I'm doing is causing the problem. So I need to change my thinking, get out of that bondage and remove myself. So wow. the, the sinful nature is human nature because every human being has a has this curse. The Bible says so. You know, if you study the word of God, which I did for 17 years, I hope to write another book called Boot Camp Before the Lord. Because it well, feels wait, what, like what was the name? What was the name of the second book, darling? What was the name of the second Boot book you're gonna write? The Lord. Boot Camp for the Lord. Gotcha, I got you. Okay, good. Because I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um wow, I, I really like that thinking. You uh you really are using um using what God gave you to help other people and you have a helping spirit anyway, just as I do. I worked as a credit union CEO for 25 years. So that's all I know is helping people and caring for people. But um, so right. can you get, can I delve a little bit deeper into your faith and to what you think God did for you? And can you kind of explain that to us too? And then we'll get back to the chapters of the book. Okay. So what do you, what do you think God did for you in your own words? Well, I was mad at God because like I hear often, well, if there's a God, why am I going through this? So I shook my fist and I said, I've been hearing about you, God, but I don't see you working for me in my life. Where are you? And, and a situation took place where he revealed himself to me. So I knew there was a God because it was very, very real, you know. And then I, then I kept reading these, this word faith, and I thought, well, what is this faith? And so I went to the library, and the corridors of the books, you walked in, there was a wall, you had to turn around and walk out. Well, I was taught to never shirk a task, and I heard a book fall on the floor. And I turned around and looked, and you know what that book was? Norman Vincent Peale, Believing by Faith. Wow. So that book. And one of the nine gifts of the spirit is faith. God gave me the gift of faith and I have never wavered since. I said, show me what to do. Tell me where to go. Help heal my mind. Guard my heart. Teach me how to pray. And, and that faith that I had is what empowered me, enabled me. And I stayed on that short, that long, short path that is so easily gotten off of. It's kind of like following a railroad track. If the train gets off the track, it derails. Well, you got to stay on track with God if you want him to work in your life. If you want to see the 7,000 blessings he says in the Bible that he's going to give you, you got to obey that word. Mm -hmm. And so I studied, I ate the word like it was food and it empowered me, it strengthened me, it changed my heart, it changed my personality, then my mind and my thinking process changed and I just started to be this different person and realized that when I looked in the mirror, I was not useless, I was not worthless, I was not this slut my husband kept calling me, I was beautiful, unique and wonderfully made by my God. And I yes, believed it. absolutely. And all victims have to believe 
you have value. It's not your fault. That's my, my message to you all out there. Well, you know, and that's why your book is so important. You're giving real life examples that are even, um, they're so apropos for this day and time. This particular type of violence does not go away and does not change over the years. So that's why uh, your book, can you hold it up for us to see? It's called Standing in the Shadows. And I think it's absolutely a beautiful book. I think that everyone's going to really want to get this book and read it because there's so much in there that will help people overcome being the victim. And that's what we're really talking about here. We get that victim mentality and that's what we, we just, we, we get down in the mire and we just, we just, we just stay in it and we have to get out. So I'm really excited about your book and I absolutely love your spirit, KD. I think you're fabulous. Uh, so what's your favorite Bible verse? I know in one of your things you mentioned first Corinthians and, uh, but is that your favorite verse? No, my favorite verse is Ephesians 6, 4, where it says, um, uh, the mind, um, God will um, cut and, and um, let me think, let me think for a minute. The word of God is sharp and active. It will cut to the bone and marrow of the hearts of mankind to know wow. that they are good. And you know, that's just exactly what the word of God does. If you obey that word, it will clean up that sinful nature. So you can recognize what you're doing that is not pleasing. We got to be God pleasers and not people pleasers. If you please God, he will fight your battles. He will feed you. He will provide for you. He, it may not be the house you want, but thank God I could have been homeless. I could have been homeless, but I believe that it, the word says, if you obey me, I will give you the desires of my heart. If you obey my commands, I will protect you. And another favorite is, is um, it's in Isaiah 54. And it's, it's that um, if those who are against you, will, uh, that lie against you and are your enemies, I will fight for you. I am your vindicator. And you have to believe that. You know, faith wow. is really something you cannot see. And God is everywhere. If you just yes. look, he's yes. everywhere. And then you know. not only that, uh, it's very difficult for us to get out of that realm of pleasing people. That's one thing that, that, that really all of us, um, I believe, have to deal with is that we, we got to start pleasing God and quit trying to please people because we can't please people. I mean, you know, if we please God, then God's going to make a way for people to be pleased. So it's just a, it's just a, a full circle there that we have to really get into. So we were on chapter three. So let's go on and tell us a little more about the going on to chapter four through 12. Uh, chapter four is denial. To deny is to give in. So if you're in this situation, and you're not doing anything about it, knowing that there's an opportunity there, that the door is open. You know, the very first step is get, in, get on your knees and get before God and ask him into your heart. You are given the gift of the Holy Spirit and he'll guide you. And he'll give you the courage to take the steps to go out that door. And you know, um, Nancy, what I uh, have seen on my fan page in Facebook where women have commented in a, a private group that I have, they don't, well, I don't want to leave my furniture or, or what about my clothes? Forget about it. I have put together five households in 50 years. You know, it's like a shopping spree. I just look at it like a shopping spree. I get to change out my house, you know, so you got to stop denying that he's hurting you. Yes, he's hurting you. He's destroying you. He's killing you. And usually a lot of women, unfortunately, do die in domestic violence yes they do chapter five is the five steps of self-discipline brings change you know it's not easy ladies and gentlemen you have to dig deep down god gave us everything we need but we've got if you become a god pleaser he's gonna show you that you have what it takes to get out 
You know, you got to have that self-discipline. And I, I have steps in there that I took, things that, that I, and you got to use the word and you got to obey it. And it's a, it's a mystery, as it says in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 2. The word of God is a mystery to mankind. Those without the spirit, it is foolishness to them. But those with the spirit, God will reveal the hidden mystery of the truth of God's word. So we have to have God in such a dangerous situation, especially if you have children, God forbid. Because then if you don't get out, it's a learned behavior. That's why our generation, I'm raising my granddaughter. She's 15 and a half. I took her at nine months and I raised her with God. So she knows and recognizes this. But if you don't take your children out of that, it's a learned behavior. They're going to go right into it and it's going to be the same thing for them. Absolutely it is. In chapter seven is temptation. Resist the devil and he will flee, says the word of God. Temptation is our soul. That's that bondage. That's where the soul lives is our sinful nature. It's, it, I call it also the fallen estate. We're all cursed with this. So we got to learn to recognize what is sin. We got to learn to know when the devil comes in and whispers those things in your ear to say no, because you have now, because you've got salvation and the Holy Spirit in you, you have the greater power in you. Yes. You can say no is all you got to say is I'm not taking this no more and, and leave. Okay. And in chapter eight, it's removing the obstacles of your temptation. Remove yourself from that china cabinet. Remove yourself from that new sofa he bought you because he beat you a week ago and he's trying to make up. Mine bought me things to try to make up for the abuse he gave me. I had a beautiful home. Well, we gotta re we got to get rid of that and remove those obstacles because they just, they're a hindrance. And they keep that bondage. They keep you in that bondage. Then chapter eight is, uh, or nine is disconnect. Cut the chains of fear. Your abuser is using the rod of fear to keep you in this position, in this bondage, so that he or she can continue to abuse you, whether whatever three of the abuses it may be, because they want to be the power. They want to hold that power over you. Well, you can't let fear, fear is not of God, fear is of the devil. Well, that's why we need God to fight a great battle because well, it is a, a war in the mind, a battle in the mind, you know. Exactly. Well, you know what, uh, Miss KD, did, uh, did your abuser get help after? I, I Do you know? I don't know. I left. I paid for the divorce. I've never seen him since, and I've never been abused since. I don't right. tolerate bad behavior. Well, I just wondered um, if through all of this, if, if the abuser ever gets help. I mean, I'm sure they, I don't know. I mean, I guess they just go on to their next victim. So you really don't know that. But wow, that's really, it's just so interesting to me because it's just such a vicious cycle. And, you know, we know from experience that it's, you know, that it's been going on for 45 years and it's still going on. I know it's been going on for 60 years because I was in it when I was a child and it's still going on. And it's the same scenario. It's the same words. It's the same thing that happened to me when I was five years old in a, in a you know, in a domestic violence situation with my mother and my father. Then it happened to you 45 years ago. So it's just a vicious circle that never, ever stops. And I oftentimes tell people, uh, especially my husband of 45 years, that I actually can tell when there's a, um, an abuse or in a relationship by their actions and their words and the way they treat their respective, uh, their respective uh, partner, whether it's right. a man or a woman, you can tell, I mean, I can tell because of my childhood and what I still have memories of just by the words that, uh, that someone speaks to their partner, if they're an abuser or not. I mean, I, I just, it's just something when you live through it, you can do that. So I'm really happy that you've written this book and that you're sharing it with us and sharing it with the world because everyone uh, needs to really read this book to learn how to start to meditate, to get over this, to get through it. So uh, what chapter are we on now? Um, 
then I went on to um, survival and the title is never give up. You have to, if you're in an abusive relationship, ladies and gentlemen, you have to look in the mirror and you have to deny, you, you can't deny yourself. You have to face the reality. You have to make the changes. You have to recognize that God is there and don't be afraid because fear is not of God. If there is fear, ask God to remove it from you so that you can press on and move forward and take the steps necessary to get out because when you do, it's going to bring change. If you never give up, you're gonna get out. You gotta learn to believe in yourself and it takes faith to do that because it's an unseen mystical mystery how God will work in your life if you put him first and foremost. I have seen a violent person being attacked and all I did was put my hand in front of their face and said, the Lord rebuke you. And he was about to attack this woman and he turned around and walked away. Wow. What, what was that? That was the power of God because I used that greater name. You yes, know, the, name, the name Jesus is, is just another name today. But let me tell you, it's the most powerful, most important name of the human race. And we as a people, as a society, 54,000 women, men, and children every day in America alone are being abused. And now it's affecting our teenagers are abusing their girlfriends at 14 and 15 and 16 years old. Yes. That is an atrocity. And wow. Well, at this point in time, I, I really, I want to finish the chapters. We don't have very much time left, but I want to okay. give the, the National Domestic Violence a hotline at this time, yeah. because I think it's so important. And as we get, get through, we're going to post, post this on the video. It's 1-800-799- 7233 and I think that's so important and that's going to lead me uh, to our next question again that's the National Domestic Violence Hotline 1-800-799-7233 and what I'd like to do now uh, before we get to the last few chapters is for you to tell us uh, what it is that's different now than when you were domestically uh, abused uh, because you make several uh, no, notes in your book about what people can do now that wouldn't work before. And we've already said well, when you go to the police or the police come to you, they don't do anything back in the old day. But tell us now some of the steps that people can do to get help for themselves. Well, one, you know, in chapter five, I list those five disciplines. You got to watch and listen, act out. Don't be, you know, don't be impulsive. It, it explains in there. And then today you can actually, when he goes to work or she goes to work, you can go to your local police station and you can tell them you're in a, a domestic violent relationship and it's serious and you have children. Maybe you do, or maybe you don't, and you want to get out. Would you please take me to a shelter? because the police station of your local vicinity, they're the only ones who know where these shelters are at because it's, it's kept quiet so that the abuser can't find you because that's a lot of the, the women, or especially women, they leave, but they get found and get pulled back. We'll go to the police station, they'll take you to a shelter. What does the shelter do? They educate you, they give you a room, a bed, a roof over your head had they feed you they'll help you get a job they'll help you find a way to get the car that you need to get back and forth to work you have the help today that years ago if i walked into a police station i had to sign an ex parte and if he begged me and i canceled it took went home i got a beating for doing it so when you sign those papers don't look back over your shoulder just your focus and stay on that track and proceed to go forward and you will succeed and the revival will come which is the last uh the name of the last chapter is welcome to the revival 
hair, hairs to a new beginning. Well, Miss Miss KD, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm I'm just so sorry we're out of time. We have a lot more we can talk to. I want to have you on again, and I want to elaborate more. I want to hear more about your second book, and I want to talk a little bit more uh, about specifics in the book, "Standing in Your Shadows" by KD Esther. And I thank you so much for your time today. And I think this is going to really help a lot of people. What what can happen now that that we didn't have available to us in the old days is really vitally important that everyone take, pay attention. There is a way out. There is a way to be restored and to be a vital, a vital person and to have your self-esteem and your self-confidence back. So thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate you. Okay. Thank you for having me on and make sure that they know that the book is available on Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble and ebook format. So absolutely. Um, thank you so much thank for that. Thank you so much for having me and God bless you, Nancy. You're doing You too. Job. You too, my dear. Bye -bye. Shine.